Thank you. How do I follow that up? Um, <laughs> I always um, love being up here. I'm really humbled being part of the teaching team at this church. And um, I was just mentioning to someone, this is, this is a unique place and um, different from almost any church that I've ever been at or served at um, in my 30 plus years of walking with the Lord. And I was mentioning to someone coming in um, about our love for one another. And, and they had said, well, you know, that's just not normal. You know, we kind of had a crisis this week and, and there was a team of people that immediately gathered and, and um, served in that crisis and dealt with the crisis um, that exists. And, um, and I said, you know, that's just out of the norm. A matter of fact, that's abnormal. We are a completely abnormal church. Um, so if you are near, new here, that's who we are. We're, we're a bunch of abnormal people. Out of the norm, you know, and I wouldn't want to have it any other way. So we're entering a time, today begins a time in the liturgical calendar of, of church calendar that um, says Passion Week or starts Passion Week, um, what we call um, the week before Christ. And this is really a significant time in regards to church history and in regards to our time. It's, it's a preparation for Easter is what it, what it comes down to. So Passion Week was the final week of Christ here on the earth. And the gospel writers found it so significant that they spent more time writing about this particular week than almost about anything in the gospels. So the gospels are 89 chapters. If you, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, first four books, there are 89 chapters total. Four chapters cover the first 30 years of Christ being here on earth. 29 of those chapters cover the last week. The final week of him being here. I think it was a little important to them. I think it was a little important to God that he focused on that last week. The writers focused there. Luke, who we're going to be in the book of Luke today, spent one-third of his book on the last week of Christ. John spent about half of the gospel of John is on the final week of Christ being here on earth. This is a big deal. As you go in this week, I pray that you constantly remind yourself every single day of the wonders of who Christ is and what he has done and that kind of thing. So we're going to be in Luke 19. So we're going to start in verse 28. After Jesus has said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. So I'm, I'm just going to set this up for you. Um, Jesus, in, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus gave kind of the last parable. And the last parable that he gives to his disciples are, quit hiding your talents. I mean, at the end of the day, he tells this story about um, giving each of his servants a portion or money and having them go and do something with that. And the simple answer to that, or the simple teaching of that parable is don't hide your talents. You know, and this is the last, one of the last things that he's saying to them before they go into Jerusalem. Because in Jerusalem, there will be some more teaching and it'll be more direct. But as far as with the general population of his disciples, this is kind of the last message. So he goes up into Jerusalem and he knew 
that there was going to be trouble. And a matter of fact, if you read in some of the other Gospels, his brothers tell him, man, are you sure you want to go? Be careful about going to Jerusalem. Because the chief priests had already made a plan to kill him. If you read the Gospel of John, the chief priests also made a plan to kill Lazarus. Because right before he goes to Jerusalem, he raises Lazarus from the dead. And he was getting too popular, too much power. Um, For those that are in power, they are always threatened by people coming up that they perceive have more power. See, leaders tend to get insecure and carry insecurities with them. And sometimes they get afraid of power. If you walk in humility, you don't ever worry about power because God gives power to those who are humble. God gives grace to those that are humble. If we keep ourselves in humility, we have his grace. His grace is power. His grace is the ability to do the things that God has called you to do and be who God has called you to be. That's his grace. I have insecurities sometimes. Yeah, I do. But I keep myself in a place of grace because God always gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud. And so, God, all I want is your kingdom and let it be. And I want to be part of that. But if you raise someone up that's a greater part of that or doing more things in it, I want to be behind them. I want to do what God is doing. Jesus is coming down to Jerusalem. He wants to do what the Father's doing. He knows that this is the last week. Verse 29, as he approaches Bethpage and Bethany at a hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt there, tied which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to the, ask them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. And they brought it to Jesus. Here's the thing. There are so many aspects to this story, and we can skip over so many things. Um, two of the disciples go into town and do this. And it was just like Jesus said. He's prophetic. He sees the word. He can answer your phone. He can do any of those kind of things. But it was just as he said. They found it just as he said. And we go through that, and we look over that, and we move on to the next part of the story. I want to just tell you this. There is no task or no assignment that the Lord can give you that is too small. They had an assignment to do. Go into town and grab this donkey. That was it. They were unnamed, generally. You can do some research and find their names, but for the most part, they were unnamed, kind of faceless, Go into town and do this. See, God will give us assignments that are many times in the background. They're significant assignments of go and work here. Go and volunteer in the food pantry. Go and serve with Rag Muffin on Wheels. Go help in the cafe on Sunday mornings or in the children's ministry. Many of these things, we have hundreds of volunteers, and you guys volunteer so well. And many times people don't 
know who you are in the larger congregation. But you do your job so well. That's being a disciple. That's part of being a disciple. Doing what God asks you to do and being obedient in doing that. That's being significant in the kingdom. We want to see your kingdom here. We want your kingdom to come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And part of that is just being obedient. Doing really simple things. These disciples went in, found the colt, and bring the donkey back to Jesus. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. John in his gospel talks about the miracles that Jesus performed in Bethany and Bethpage. And it's about a two-mile walk from there to Jerusalem. And you go down the valley and into the Kidron Valley and then come right back up um, to Zion or to Jerusalem. And in that time, the crowds start to gather. They hear of the miracle of Jesus. Now, the scholars will tell you that there was probably two million people or more that had descended on Jerusalem because this was a time of the Passover. And two million people, and at the time of the Passover, get this, over 250,000 lambs were sacrificed, not including any of the other animals there. They would have teams of priests that would make the sacrificial offering to God. And they would go day and night from the time that we celebrate Palm Sunday, four days before the Passover, was when it would start. And they would continually go and go and go, making the sacrifice to atone for our sins. And Jesus being the perfect Lamb of God coming to be sacrificed. So this day, God had ordained very specifically. This is the day that the Lord had made. And the crowd was actually saying that. And they were singing that. Hosanna. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. In the Jewish world, or in Jewish custom, there is what they call the Hillel Psalms. And these are psalms of praise and psalms of thanksgiving that every Jewish child learns at the very beginning of their education. And they're, they're Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. And these songs are taught, these psalms are taught and memorized, and it is a praise to God. So if you um, this week want to do something, look at Psalm 113 through Psalm 118, and every one of those themes is praising God. And so what they're quoting here to Jesus is they're actually singing a song that they learned as children of Hosanna. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Psalm 118 um, verse 24 says, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If you've been around church, different churches in any length of time, how many of you have sung that song? <laughs> See a lot of you. 
This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Seth, we need to add that to the worship set somewhere. I don't know. Call, call it retro worship, you know, something like that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, when I got saved um, and we, Michelle and I started teaching Sunday school, and that was one of the first songs that we learned teaching kids in Sunday school. But see, the significant thing is that, that I don't want to lose is that today is the day. See, March 10th, 32 AD, was when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And how do we know that? Because 480-some-odd, 489, 483 years before that, God prophesied on that day Jesus was coming in. So if you can go and look back, and you don't have to turn here, to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, he gives this prophecy, and he says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And then he goes on to say different things in regards to the Messiah. And again, you can be reading the Old Testament and, and not understand a lot of what was written and how it was written, but each week actually represents seven years. So there'll be seven weeks, so seven seven-year periods, which is 49 years, and 62 seven-year periods, which, are 480, which equal 483 62 and, and um, the 7 equals 483 years. It's a long, long time. Now, why is that important? It's only important to the fact that God was predicting exactly when Messiah would come. And how do we know the date? Well, if you look in the book of Nehemiah, and the, look, and the book of Haggai, it gives the specific date and time when the decree was given to rebuild Jerusalem. And so you take that date and you add 170, 173,880 days. Because that's how the Jewish calendar was calculated. And you add that and you get the exact date that Jesus came into Jerusalem. See, this is the day. Today is the day that God has made. Rejoice and be glad. See, you're not here by any happenstance or just oh, I just happened to see the church and was walking by and popped in today. Maybe that was the case. But God ordained you here today for a very specific reason. He put me here today. Nothing happens by chance with him. He knew the day from before time that Jesus was going to enter Jerusalem. He knew the day before time that you were going to be sitting here today. There is a reason for you being here. Jesus came riding on a donkey, riding on a colt. It's a miracle in and of itself. I mean, we could talk about the multiple miracles, God ordaining the day, all the events that happen, go in the town, find the donkey. Um, if anyone questions you, just say the Lord needs it. They did. All that happens. This donkey had never been ridden. 
I spent a lot of time, um, we used to live in a ranching community, a um, little bit east and north of here called Elizabeth, and um, hung out with a lot of ranchers and a lot of cowboys, people that did it for a living. One thing that you never did, you never got on a horse that had never been ridden before. <laughs> Guess what happens when you get on a horse that's never been ridden? You end up on your keister on the ground lying flat on your back because that horse doesn't like people riding on them. They have to be trained. I, I spent time with a guy that was a horse trainer and they used to tease him about being a horse whisperer. But that was his job. He would go and break horses in to be able to be ridden. And he'd whisper to the horses and that kind of thing. Jesus gets on this donkey that had never been ridden before. And the donkey takes him into Jerusalem. Kings would do that in a time of peace. So when there was a peaceful season... Instead of coming in on a stallion, which was a sign of, of being in war and being in battle, kings would come in on a donkey, which was humility and peace. And Jesus comes in full of humility, bringing peace. Which was contrast to the culture there, because they were in anything but peace. Peace. The Jewish nation had been occupied by the Romans. The Romans were oppressors. If you didn't follow their laws, you would be thrown in jail. You'd be beaten. And the worst of the criminals would be crucified. Four days later from this, Jesus would be crucified. The Romans were not good people. It was very strict, very oppressive. And maybe many of you understand that and know that. Maybe you were raised in an environment where it was really strict and oppressive. But God is here for you to break free from that. Instead of a place of peace it was a place of turmoil it was a place of tribulation some of you are in this place in your lives right now it's anything but peace you're going through a battle you're going through a war and maybe that war is addiction there's oppression, anger, unforgiveness. There is loss. But Jesus is coming. He's coming riding on a donkey. Riding on a beast of peace. Jesus is coming to redeem us. To carry our burdens. He will break our chains. He conquered sin. He beat death. He sets us free. He is here to say, I will restore you and I will heal you. That's what this day is about. That's what him coming into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey. We call it Palm Sunday. The people broke palms from the trees. Glorifying and raising their palms and singing, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Jewish word is Hosheel. God save us now. What religion can't do for us. What me being trying to make myself clean, doing all the ceremony, doing all the things that want to make me right, what I can't do to make me right. Jesus can do to set me free. Amen. And he will do it. He wants to do it. 
Today is the day for you to be set free. To live your life in a place of freedom. I am not here today to save you from hell. We get this idea of like, well, I want this insurance policy so I don't go to hell, so I'll go to church. I am here today to introduce to you a man who died for your sins. Come on. Come on. Come on. Amen. A man that if you choose to have a relationship with him, he will change your life and he will set you free. Amen. Yeah. That's who I want to introduce you to today. So your life will be one of freedom. And your eternal life will be spent with him. He will save your life. As the worship team comes up, I want to close with the hope of freedom. See, there's storms that exist in your life. There's storms that exist in mine. It was interesting that when I um, got saved a long time ago, I read the Bible. I, I was um, mentored by a group of men, and, and they took a, a small group of us. Um, we were 20-something-year-olds, and um, we went and threw the Bible in one year um, from cover to cover. And the interesting thing was that it was a King James version of the Bible. Amen. <laughs> and I knew I'd get an amen from Damon. Um, and, it's, and it's funny because um, the first verses that I ever memorized in the Bible were in the King James Version. And I've gotten mature and saved since then and learned them in other versions. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but the point being is that there's a story about... Jesus getting into the boat with the disciples and storms come and, and waves are overcoming the boat. And he's sleeping down below. And they wake him up and say, Lord, don't you care if we drown? And Jesus goes to the top of the boat and he says, peace be still. And the winds stop. And the storms stop. And Peter makes the comment out of the King James Bible of what manner of man is this? That even the wind and waves obey him. See the storms that are happening in your life? I'm presenting to you the man that speaks, peace be still. And the waves stop. And the storms stop. Whatever issues you're carrying, unforgiveness, addiction, oppression, pain, physical body pain, God wants to do a work today. This is the day that the Lord has made. You are not here by accident. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's stand. Thanks for tuning in to a message from the Sanctuary Church. For more information and media, go to our website at thesanctuarywestside.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. 